Patrick Johnston of the province and post media joins us from UBC where the Vancouver Canucks are practicing. No Rogers Rogers, baby. Oh, is it? He's an O's. Yes. Know your geography, Matt. Know your backgrounds. There's no background. Uh, it's over. just I, you know, UBC is the de facto practice facility. Yeah, and I thought, you know, sure enough, there's got to be a concert. Uh, oh, no, yeah, amazingly. My no bad, concerts, Rogers man. Arena. There he is. Yeah. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. A little chilly up here, level 500, but I can see practice. J Pat's down there somewhere. Yes, you're our uh, bird bird's eye view view of practice and. Uh, uh, hey, they get back at it. This is a chance to shake off uh, the the road trip. There's no need to worry about first game back after a long road trip here. Is there, PJ? No, never. When you're the rested team and you're playing a team coming from Calgary the night before, that's never a trap game ever. No, 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 <laughs> never. But honestly, like, don't make an excuse. Don't don't make us question that. Uh, I honestly don't. Th- there shouldn't be a good reason why they don't look good tomorrow. No, the the that. Uh, Yes, they're the rested team. Uh, the Blues, who can't seem to score, are in Calgary tonight and lost in Winnipeg on Tuesday. Uh, and this is a Canucks team that, I mean, okay, some of the goals have come through bounces. Um, they're, they're definitely out shooting their expected goals. Uh, but coming off, I would say, other than that opening night win, the most comprehensive performance of the season. They, they played a solid, quality road game on Tuesday night to beat Nashville, a team that's probably not that great, but nonetheless defended well, did all the kind of bits and pieces that we need to see from this team to think that they actually have something going this season. And they're in the right spot. They're in the spot they want to be. They're four and two. Uh, And you mentioned the Blues, 11 goals in five games. So, yeah, there is no scoring there. Uh, And and frankly, PJ, a – an opponent much like Nashville, if you take a look at last year's standings, St. Louis finished just a little behind the Canucks, Nashville a little bit ahead. Yeah. These are the sorts of conference games that may take on more weight as we get down towards March and look at the playoff bar and who's in and who's out. Well, especially as we try to figure out how the specific division is going to shake out. Like, are they going to try to – is this going to be a division that's going to steal the uh, the overlap spot into the Central? Um, I think coming into the season, we maybe thought that was a possibility. I'm not so sure about that now, given the struggles of the Oilers and the Flames, but it is a long season. And yes, these as this team well knows, you know, any any points you give away at this point in the season will, could come back to bite you at the end of the year. And, and certainly when you're playing a conference rival, a team that you are theoretically also chasing for a playoff spot, these kinds of these kinds of games, these are four pointers. These are four pointers already. And you don't want to have the story that they've had the last two years where it comes back to bite them in the butt. Well, and the other story that is emerging, my friend, with a six and zero start from Colorado, a seven and zero start yeah. from the Vegas Golden Knights. I mean, you can almost argue we're down to six playoff spots in the Western Conference yeah, already yeah. with the quality of those teams. Now, if it was just any team getting off to a good start, you I might trust say, it. Yeah. but, but yeah. Those, those are the last two cup champions. So yeah. I, I think we can believe in both those teams being yeah. real yeah. and going to secure their spot in the Stanley cup playoffs as well. It's the teams that start four and two, like we're back. Right. Mm. That you're like, hmm, is this a real start or is this just a run of uh, good, good luck, good opportunity, what have you. I, it's exactly it. Again, this is the kind of game. If you fancy yourself a playoff team at the end of the year, you got to be winning these games more often than not. I um, I caught your story on Vasily Podkolson yesterday, being a new father and all that it entails, uh, particularly on his free time or what free time uh, at this stage of the game with a newborn. Uh, we also had a post that went out yesterday talking about Vasily Podkolson and his fantastic start with the Abbotsford Canucks. But of course, the entirety of the conversation changed uh, around Vasily Podkolson last night after he took that hit and that awful scene with him down on the ice convulsing and stretchered off. But you got a chance to catch up with him or at least message with well, him. I, yeah, I mean, I talked to him briefly. You know, I talked to him on the phone, so I just sent him, hey, you hope you're all right. And, you know, it was after he'd posted on Instagram, so it wasn't like I was jumping over chasing after anything, just saying, hey, good to see you doing okay. So yeah, I think you can be all right. Heard from uh, Ben Goodman this morning, the PR guy, the hardworking PR guy with the Abbotsford Canucks, and just sort of said, hey, you know, as I had messaged him, hey, man, that's a scary scene. Hopefully everything's all right. Hopefully you guys are doing okay. He goes, yeah, it was in the moment, but 
you know, you get up this morning and he said, yeah, it was good to, good to hear from Basilio that he's doing well. And, and, um, and, and, you know, is at least in a good spot for now, of course, you know, anytime you have any, it sounds like it was you know, a pretty serious head injury uh, from the descriptions in the moment. So, you know, today is a new day and you hope that today is better than it was last night and honor is an honor is an honor. But uh, yeah, a player who I think was finding his way. And then the story I put together, we talked to, talk to Pug Coles and we talked about being a new father and the sort of pressures that having a newborn bring to the table and, and learning how to reorganize your life a little bit while also having to deal with, with the, the ins and outs of being a professional athlete and learning that stuff. And I talked to Jeremy Carlton about that and he made the point. He said, listen, you know, this is something that every young person has to learn. They have to learn that being a professional athlete, that success as a professional athlete is about taking care of all the things that you kind of maybe don't want to do. You know, you're a 22 year old guy, most 22 year old guys, you know, I think are like any 22 year old. Oh, I'll get to it, you know. But now he has a kid. He has no choice. There is no time. And this is a point I made, you know, I made more than once to friends who've had new kids and uh, having, you know, kind of gotten to sort of the certain stage we're at with a five and three year old. And I said this to Colton. I said, you know, the thing I used to say is after the first kid, you realize how much time you were wasting before the first kid. And then you have a second kid and you discover you were still wasting time. And, and, and Colton, who's a father of three, just started laughing, you know, to a level that you don't often get from a hockey coach. But there was a very understanding appreciation of the point. And, and that was very much where they're at. And I think, you know, I don't think there's been any question of Pud Colson's love of the game. He's that guy who's always been there first on the ice, first off the ice. Think about Bruce Brujo talking about that endlessly last year, almost having to kick him off the ice because they were like, there's other things you need to take care of. Um, the other thing that stood out for me from that conversation, as you know, hopefully Pud Colson returns to the ice in, in short order, um, what was Colton's point was that, you know, yeah, he's had a good start. Things are going well. He's had a couple really dominant periods, but the point is, is that you need to understand the level you can consistently be in. It's not flipping a switch. It's not going, oh, I'm going to be really good this shift. It's just understanding that your level that you maintain every time you're on the ice, no matter your role, is always what Rick Talk has been talking about, being that energy guy, bringing, you know, every player should be an energy guy. It's not, a, oh, today I'm going to throw a hit. Tonight I'm going to do this. It's every time you're out. And that's the biggest thing Colton said. Yes, now we're working on that sort of consistency. He's been scoring the goals. He, that goal he scored on Tuesday night was kind of why it got me thinking about, about um, writing the story. It was, you know, here he is, he's in overtime. And you can see in the sequence, he is in the neutral zone. He has the puck. He's in control. He pauses to let Archie Thanes come out of the zone. And he sees the hole to hit, which is all the way around almost the other side and blows through the Colorado Eagles defense, gets on top of the net, backhand goal, forehand backhand, like a goal scorer's goal, the kind of goal that a kid of his talent, of his pedigree, should be scoring at that level. And, and it's about channeling that and recognizing this is who you can be every time. It's not that you need to score a goal every time, but that every time you're on the ice, there's a chance for you to make something happen. And, and I'm glad that his injury didn't come on a play like that. Yeah. Um, you know, so that it wouldn't instill fear in, in his ability to go do that again. I mean, uh, I'm not glad he got the injury at all, obviously, but um, right. but the fact that it comes off a, a rather, you know, he's not doing anything extravagant in the corner. He's just slew footed, um, and um, and I, I think that leads you to believe he will still have the confidence to make that play again. I hope when yeah. he gets back yeah. on the ice. Yeah, exactly. I think you're right. Like there is sort of always going to be that worry that. He's going to have some time to come back and find his confidence again and, and physically beyond the sort of all the comp, you know, sort of mental game stuff we were talking about, but just literally being on the ice, feeling comfortable. Um, it, it's, you know, it certainly sounds like it was, it looked scarier than it actually was. Um, obviously, you know, he got, looks like he got knocked out at some point. I mean, concussions happen in many ways and you hope that there isn't a lingering effect with this one either. I mean, you know, obviously we've seen lots of guys come through, you know, Tucker Pullman is sitting on IR with a migraine, but I think probably connected to head injuries. Yeah. And, um, you know, you just, you just hope that this, yeah, like you said, from a playing standpoint, it doesn't throw them off. And you also hope that from a, from just sort of a long-term health standpoint. And sometimes it doesn't need to be an injury to your head for to keep you away for an unexpected amount of time. Still no sign of Teddy Bluger for the Vancouver Canucks, uh, PJ. 
I could have sworn I would have. Uh, it's a bad time to say I would have bet on this uh, with the Pinto suspension, but um, I would have. I would have guessed, if not bet, that that Bluger would have been on the ice. Not that he would have been ready to play, but I would have bet that he would have been on the ice just to give it a, a twirl. But uh, you know, again, there's there must be something nagging here that's keeping Teddy Bluger away. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I, I think originally we thought. It, I think the term they basically indicated it was a bruise. Obviously, I mean, that's what we're, we're trying to think of how long. I mean, it's been two weeks now, basically. Yeah. Right? So, um, two and a half weeks. Obviously, it was more of a sprain. You know, it, 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 I, yeah. So, it, he's a guy they want to get in the lineup. They believe in, they want to have more. It's certainly, um, you look at the options that are there and probably fancy him more than like, I mean, Niels Hoaglander has been playing well. They're kind of in a position where they're going to have to start making some maybe difficult decisions. You know, Bavillier's on the fourth line, Garland's on the third line. You can start seeing why they are actually thinking about okay, should we move on from Garland? Um, you know, you always want to have more than you need, but you know, the, the they they it's a thing. If they keep playing okay and they keep getting results, you can sort of see okay, they're dealing from the position they want to be in. Um, that they, they, they do have guys that they can swap in, swap out. I mean, Coos wrote a story yesterday about basically talk at, looking at his guys, especially around the edges, because he knows his energy players, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, physical expectation of being an energy guy may not be something you can do literally every night. It may just be that you need an extra game off here and there, so you're swapping guys in and out. But at the end of the day, Teddy Bluger is here to be a, role, a key player as a, a depth player, a key player on the penalty kill. They want to get in the lineup. And um, he'll, they believe he'll make the team better. So yeah, the longer he's out, the, the you know the more this sort of conversation about is this really as good a team as we think they are with carrying him. Well, and um, that of course delays what was looking to be a pretty tricky decision if Bluger is ready to come back, who is coming out of the lineup. Which brings yeah. me to Nils Hoglander, Peach, who has already been a healthy scratch once this season. What have you made of his game? And do you think that you're, uh, are we seeing the signs that this guy is finally going to arrive as an every game NHLer? Well, yeah, it, the fourth line, I mean, the depth lines in general, I don't think have been, haven't been producing enough on the whole. Of course, we're still only six games in, so we're still trying to build a picture of what this team really is. But certainly in the early going, those both the third and fourth lines have been more focused on stuff in their own end and you'd rather have them not being stuck in their own end and uh so that he is a, he is a factor in that standpoint of that they need some of these guys who are there obviously to be not a problem when your stars are off the ice if, is the best way to put it um but you want to have them add something to their game and bring something to the table and uh um he he's been okay like he's shown some stuff but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's that consistency question. And right now, you know, I don't know if he is necessarily a lock. Right now he's shown that when he goes in the lineup, he can help. He can help score some goals and make some offensive impact. But it's about everything that happens and how often are they in their own end, non unable to get out. And, and if he can be a player that can help fix that problem, he's going to stay in the lineup. But that remains the question for me of what, how he fits on this roster is that two way element? Is is this? A, is yeah. he is he adding? Is it you know the goals matter, but is he adding sure. overall? For sure, yeah. because um, frankly, I'm not sure you have a lot of better options in terms of helping the production in the bottom six from who you're playing there. I think Oglander is probably your best goal scorer in that bottom six, especially yeah. if Beauvillier is going to continue to be a zero. So you're quite right. If the defensive detail is there, it's an easy answer for this coaching staff. Uh, we will see if he can. If he can sustain here, answer me the Bodog poll question. Here's Kronik. Will it be appearing all season? No. I, I, no, I, I, I still stand by the, the sense of that it makes more sense to split them up. Um, I get the heavy minutes aspect of it, but I still think you'd rather have them not. I mean, Kronik's a guy who wants the puck. And when you're playing with Hughes, you're not going to have the puck. So that to me just alone, I mean, I, I get having this kind of dominant pair if they're going to play 25 minutes a night, I guess. But I still think long term, the preference is to split them up and have two two pairs that play a ton and a third pair that doesn't play very much. And 
you know, I think realistically we're starting to see that a little bit with with you know Tyler Myers, for instance, played a lot less the last two games. He played 13 minutes both nights. Um, I think that's kind of where things are headed, and whether that means your second pair is a, you know a Friedman Ian Cole setup. I mean, I suppose, but I think in the end, maybe Friedman has not. I, I still don't know what we think of Friedman, what he actually is. I think we think he's better than Noel Juleson. Um, I'm not sure he is a guy that will fit with Hughes. And that brings us back to the Garland discussion. I mean, we can see why the team is still interested in finding another defenseman. They'd like to find a guy I think that can play higher up in the roster. And um, that's, I think, you know, it, it's hard to make trades right now, as everyone says, but it's not impossible. And um, yeah, so I, I don't think there'll be a partner, partnership for the whole season. Lastly, what do you make of this Shane Pinto affair? Well, uh, you know, the moment that the NHL made a statement, I know kind of people are like, oh, that's not real clarity, but I saw Shane Pinto and NHL games, and I thought that was doing a lot of work. And, you know, it sounds like from what we can gather that there was a third party involved, someone using his account, placing bets where they shouldn't be. And this is, this is the world. I mean, I would say credit to the NHL for making a strong statement on this. Um, obviously they've opened themselves up to all kinds of vulnerabilities by having all these partnerships with betting agencies. And uh, it's a story I've been trying to press on and haven't honestly had a lot of people willing to talk about it. But, you know, the, the threats, the thing to understand about match fixing isn't just we played to lose, right? We played, we played for an outcome and that could be any outcome. And, you know, referees, I think are under threat for this kind of thing. This is what happens in soccer. It's yellow cards and, penalties and all kinds of other bits and pieces in the game, not just the result. Um, any, any influence towards a particular outcome that would you can put money on is a threat. And, and you know, I think the NHL, uh, I, uh, in making this statement, is doing the right thing by saying, guys, listen, we know you're under a lot of pressures. We know that you can bet on it and just put anything now more than ever, anywhere, anytime. Um Obviously, they've got these partnerships with betting agencies, betting companies. But this is how it goes. Like, you have to be clear. And, and this is as clear a statement as it can be. Like, do not, you well, know, do yeah. not put yourself in that position. You have the knowledge of injuries ahead of time, too, guys. Like, they, there's insider knowledge there, there as well. Of so. course there is. On who's starting yeah. at goaltender, yeah. on all sorts of topics. And yeah. Yeah. full credit to them for the heavy suspension. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure uh, we want to give him full credit with regards to the transparency. I, I do think I would like to hear more specifically because I think a lot of people were asking the question, okay, what did he do that was wrong? Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure we have a clear answer on what he did to merit a half season suspension, yeah. which just off the top of my head has to be one of the longest suspensions in NHL history. Yeah. Right. And, and so, I would say the other thing too is to understand that, like, when you do these kinds of things, you put yourself at risk of threats from other people, right? Like, right. it's not just it's the position you put yourself in. It's not just whether you're betting for fun on a game that has, you know, every game in theory has an impact on your own team. But you know, for instance, you're an Ottawa Senators player, you're probably thinking a Kings versus Duck game doesn't probably have a huge lot of impact on you. But it's the mere a possibility of you being in a vulnerable position. You run up a bunch of debts. Someone comes at you and says, well, this is what we're going to do in exchange. And it becomes this sort of second, third order consequence. It's not just if this, then that. It's all the other things that come down the chain. And, and that's, to me, why I think, yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, the NHL would be good to be clear on this. Here right. is what we were concerned about, and here is why you cannot do this. If well, they're, they're going to be encouraging betting in every one of the professional avenues, mm -hmm. if they're encouraging betting for the general public, what is it that this player has done mm -hmm. that exactly. is outside those bounds, right? It's, yeah. it's hypocrisy. Because... Uh, like I this do. policy or whatever, right? You know, yeah. like mm -hmm. here's our yeah. policy. Here's the here's the section because you know in the end there's oh, you break a rule on the ice. They tell you which rule it is. You know, yeah. the, here's the suspension under these. Can't terms. be arbitrary. No. Yeah, because the other thing here is I I do believe there is a lot of ignorance on the part of the public in terms of why this is the cardinal sin that yeah. leagues view it. Yeah. We got a lot of that. I mean, when I first started in sports talk radio. You know, the Pete Rose thing was still raging. 
And people were going, I don't understand. What if he, if he bet on the Reds to win, why is that a problem? Well, from the manager's office, because, you know, if you're betting on the team to win, it may affect the way that you manage the game, not to mention what you just mentioned, the ability, uh, the uh, concern of accumulating debts. And, of course, back in those days, accumulating debts with unsavory Near, figures. Wells, yes. We know the head coach of the Vancouver Canucks has yep. fell victim to this and made a mistake way back when and got punished for it. So I'll be interested to see if uh, Rick Tockett has anything to say on this going forward. But yeah, I I just don't think that the public sort of understands the severity in the eyes of a league or a commissioner of gambling. And this is why those signs are posted in major league baseball clubhouses and like block letters. Uh, This is the number one thing that they're concerned about because it threatens the enterprise. I mean, I go back to that, uh, you know, five, six years ago, El Salvador, remember the men's uh, men's national soccer team was here and they had a huge allegation of being approached of an approach. And they brought it up to their credit. They said, we had an approach from someone from, I think it was from Honduras. So they're basically trying to influence us. And it wasn't about whether El Salvador was going to beat Canada. It was a particular outcome. If you can try to create this particular outcome, we will pay you this much money because there's a betting market that is really interested in this result. Um, it is all those kinds of things. And, and I remember writing that story and people were like, well, but they were being given bonuses to win. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like it, it is the mere fact of creating a relationship between you and an unsavory character that is trouble for was that it was, it was consorting with, I mean, this goes back to the Black Sox. It's consorting with gamblers. Like that's why baseball has been so hard on this for so long. Um, mm-hmm. And, and you know, hockey, like I said, hockey was right to make this, or the NHL was right to make this yeah. stand, but the clarity needs to be there. Yeah, uh, and uh, especially in this whole new world where, uh, of course, sports wagering is a much more accepted uh, part of the culture in North America, which, of course, it has been in other parts of the world for for years. Wonderful stuff. Thank you for this. We will catch up next week, Patrick. Take care, guys. It's happy hour on Sakaris and Price. Today's beer of the day from Neighborhood Brewing, the lifelong light lager.